So hello, everyone. Um, I'm Albert Franzi from Alpha Health from Barcelona. And I will be here talking about how to modularize your Spark code into pieces. First of all, I would like to share my slides. So uh, this should be more or less the only photo that you can take during the presentation. You can take other, but this one is the, <laughs> the main photo. So you can also see the slides while I'm talking or just uh, afterwards you can review with them. I will wait a few seconds for that. OK, so I will go. Yeah. So I would like to introduce myself so you have more or less some context about who I am and what I've been doing over these uh, past years. I started in Trobit, a marketplace uh, company that uh, we were working there with uh, map reviews. No? Uh, I think Spark was quite in the first steps, so we didn't know it about th that. Also, we work with Storm. I would like to know if anyone here is still using Storm. I don't think so. No, it's quite deprecated. And then uh, I moved to Shipstead, a company that owns multiple marketplaces and newspapers around the world. There, we were working with uh, Redshift, with uh, SQL pipelines that I was lucky to move to PySpark first, and then to Scala Spark. This movement was because the people was more uh, familiar with Python, so we decided to go to PySpark, and then when, once they were familiar with the Spark, then we moved to Scala Spark, so it was uh, better performance and easier for everyone. Also, we have Luigi for orchestration, Jupyter for uh, research and ad hoc uh, analysis, Kafka for ingesting, Elasticsearch, and then also we implement some uh, Presto as a service, so people was uh, able to access uh, all the data with uh, SQL. And then recently I joined Alpha, a health company, where we try to um, solve and reduce the amount of uh, chronic disease using data. Here we are using instead of Luigi uh, Airflow, but still Spark and all the other tools. So once we know each other, more or less each other, I will. Let's talk about the how to modularize. Here, what you will learn. I will, I will talk about how to modularize your code into different pieces, also how to test it, how to improve your code coverage by using the Spark testing base library by Holden Carao, and also how to reduce the, the time of your, uh, that it takes your test. That will imply less coffees at the end. No? You know that uh, testing a Spark can imply having a lot of time no, in, uh, in, in Travis or Jenkins or whatever tool you're using. So I will show you how we reduce this uh, execution time. So let's go for the first point. First of all, also, I would like to know how many data engineers do we have here? OK, data scientists or data analysts? OK, so less people, that will kill me. I would like to, to ask for the data engineers, how many times did you find some uh, Spark job, Spark code with 1,000 lines, more or less? How many it was like a full of duplicated code? And then you find out that uh, some duplicated code was full of bugs, and then you were like finding the same bug again and again, also across different Spark jobs, not in the same. So that happens a lot to me. And it's not the fault of a uh, data scientist. It's also our fault, because we should uh, provide the right tools to them to avoid these cases. So my, we are, our advice here is don't play with duplicated code, never and ever. I'm sure that you are familiar with the uh, design. So I'm sure that you don't want to play with these cute twins. <laughs> so don't play neither with uh, duplicated code, please. But for doing that, we figure out, you know, we need to figure out what we can do to start splitting the code into different uh, pieces, you know, into Lego in that case. So we have uh, readers, we have transformers. You know, at the end, transformers is what modifies the data, the data frames. So it can be aliases, uh, joins, formatters, whatever that it modifies the data. Then also you have the context where you put all this together, and then you have the, the Spark writers. And also, by splitting the code into different pieces, then it helps you to uh, divide and conquer the problem and to uh, solve each thing individually. For the readers and the writers, the thing is that we have started enforcing um, the schemas. You know that uh, 
Spark uh, inherits the, the schema of the data that you are reading using more or less, I think, the, by default, the first thousand rows. However, if you are using JSON or other schema-less um, data, then you could like, uh, end with problems with the formats because maybe the first thousand rows, it looks one way, then the other one's not. So you can like having problems with the schemas. So by enforcing them, you are going to be sure that you don't have these problems. Also, if you are using columnar data, columnar format like a parquet or some data engine that uh, can uh, push down the predicate, like uh, MongoDB, for example, uh, then you can skip reading some columns that you are not going to use. So that will imply uh, less network usage and faster jobs. Also, what we uh, advise here is that you use, you provide readers per data set. I will show an, uh, an example later about that. So uh, like people can use a reader that is attached to a data set. So okay, I'm going to read user behavior data, then use this reader. I'm going to use, I want to read, I don't know, um, health data, use this reader. No, so it's like people only use one reader for each thing. Also, share the schemas. No, uh, you are going to read some data using a schema, but also you, want, you are going to write this data using a schema. So use the same schema, and you, are know, you will know that you will more or less look the same. And I don't know, maybe here in the United States, I don't know how many people here is from Europe, but we have the GDPR uh, law enforced last year that it quite a pain in the ass for uh, data because it, for, it forces you to delete some data. And if you have all the data in S3 that is immutable, then you need to rewrite it. Maybe now with the Delta Lake from Databricks, it could be easier. I never tried it, but uh, maybe will be less uh, pain. So let's iterate for an example where I show how to simplify all these uh, readers and how to approach this uh, challenge. Here we have the user behavior schema. It's something I didn't want to put here because otherwise it will, wouldn't fit the screen. Then we have some path to S3. Now S3, bucket, user behavior, and all the partitions. Now we have the year, the month, the hour, whatever, no? And then we have a riddle builder that is reading parquet data with this schema, with this path, and then we are just building the reader and reading a data frame. What if instead of knowing all the partitions, all the year, month, day, we start providing some, uh, okay, some duration and some uh, zone date time? No, okay, I want to read from now to 12 hours ago. Then I just have a path builder, and okay, I say the, bus, the base path and all the other things. So then I can read multiple paths with just one line instead of writing all the strings no, for the path. However, what if we just put all the path builder inside the riddle builder? We just have the schema here, we have the base path, the start date, and the duration. So we only need to know the duration and this line. However, we could go one step further, and we just provide a user behavior reader, where our data scientist only need to know, okay, this reader is reading user behavior data, and the only thing that I need to provide is the starting time and the duration of the data that I want to read. Then, also as data engineer, we test this line of code, well, all the information that is inside this, but they don't need to know about how it's tested or how it works internally. You just provide, okay, this is a reader for user behavior data. Then it's easier for them. Then if we go to the transformers, no, I don't know if you're familiar with the, trans the transformers. They are native in the Scala API. The thing is that given a data set, it returns another data set. No, it has some magic inside that it transforms the data. So here we have some uh, Hello World examples with, uh, with reading. No, at the end, it's just given a data frame, it's adding a new column that it has a literal Hello World. Oh, another one that is extracting from JSON, that given an input column, an output column, and a schema, it's extracting this data and it's returning as a, as a field. No, it's quite basic. At the end, it's one line, but it's easier to, to read or to understand that a function is extracting from a JSON than uh, forcing your people that, okay, the data frame with column, output column from JSON, schema, everything. It can be easier for them. So if we go to a real example, 
imagine that you want to read, uh, I don't know, classify ads for a marketplace. Then you have, okay, only I only want the, this data that event type is a view and the object type is classify ad. Then also I define something that it drops duplicates. At the end it's just DF drop duplicates because you know that sometimes when you are handling events, it can happen that you have more than once. So you want to drop that once to avoid counting twice or different noise on your insights. And then imagine that you have a city column that uh, at the end is just an address and you want to clean it so you only get the address, the real city name instead of all the post name and different things. And at the end you just stack up all of them. So you have a sequence when you have the drop duplicates, then you want to clean the city and then you want only the classify ads. So you read again you know, using the reader here and then you transform all the transformations together in a sequence base. However, here I'm writing all the code, but what the data scientist or the data analyst should use is like that. You provide a list of transformers, and then they choose the ones that they need for the receipt, not for the, the dessert. Now, so here it's like, okay, I'm a data scientist, I want to drop duplicates, I want to clean the city field, and then I only want to classify ads. So I just pick them, I read, and I transform. It's quite easier because they don't need to implement all the internal code of these transformations. They only need to see which ones are available and then they can be make better work. So our job will be like providing a list, a catalog of all the transformations that are available there so they can like uh, be empowered. For this, I would like to share uh, a real good uh, library. Open source is Spark Daria from uh, Matthew Powers that is here, so say hi to the people. So if anyone wants to know more, uh, you can go to the, the GitHub or to these two articles. Oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> spoilers. <laughs> so the thing here, you have these two articles. Uh, they are really good to understand the transformer. It was our inspiration to start using it. So I will recommend you to to take a look or to go to him and uh, talk to him. And then here is like, okay, I talk about readers, writers, and transformers, and now I need the missing piece, the context. How I join everything together in the same place. One thing that we started doing is that we used to have all the readers on the same place, you know, on the same script that you just say, okay, I'm reading from that path, I'm, I don't know, a dot, JSON or uh, .csv with headers and different things, and then I'm doing all the transformations and everything. But what we believe is that when you have a context, this context should only handle all the transformations and all the logic that you are doing with the data. It shouldn't care about if you are reading from JSON, from a CSV, from Kafka, from whatever. You shouldn't care about the context and the, and the connector that you are using. So instead of that, what we belief is that, okay, you just provide readers and writers. In that case, we have the activity insights job where we have the two readers, no, the, 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 they are Spark readers, and one writer. That is uh, the end, the, the output of this job. You have the Spark session that extends a Spark task, and then in the run is where you have all the logic of the, the Spark job that you are doing. What we have is like we have the analytics metric the, sorry, the analytics reader that is reading with a schema. If you don't provide the schema, it will read, it will use the full schema, but imagine that you only want a few fields, then you specify which schema you are going to use, and then it will be faster. Then you have some transformations. Here we are like adding, no, it's like, is activity impression, is activity view, is book market, then is computing some counters, some metrics by activity ID, and then is calculating some rating scores. Then also we have another reader that is reading the activities here, and then it's cleaning them, it's enriching with the previous data frame, and then it's hashing the activity ID, and then it's uh, adding the with now, so we know when these uh, insights were computed, and then we just write it. Here is the code that it's handling all the logic of this Spark job, but we don't need to to be aware of, okay, is writing in a Redis, is writing 
in S3 is writing wherever. No, we, we here we just have this logic, and also it's easier to test because you don't need to to mock uh, S3. You don't need to mock uh, wherever. No, it's like okay, I have a data frame, and then you have uh, the output. You can one thing that we do, for example, is that uh, the spar reader we have uh, some mock spar reader that at the end is not writing the data frame. When you call write, instead of writing, it has already a data frame expected inside the, the reader, either, sorry, the writer. So when you call write, it checks to the expected data frame. So it's easier for all the people that is coding Spark to uh, uh, forget about uh, the output. Okay, that's all about simplifying your code. Now I will move to uh, how to increase the test coverage by using the Spark testing base library. Uh, before, I would like to ask how many of you put untested code into production sometime? Ever? Come on, we don't lie to me. <laughs> it's a lot of people. So I know. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I tested in production, right? <laughs> so I don't know if you are familiar with uh, the Mars Climate Orbiter, but it was destroyed in, uh, because there was a mix between units, the, the global ones and uh, miles, I think. So there was one component. It was expecting one type of uh, one metric system, another component that it was expecting another one. So between them, it was uh, an error, and then it fails. So I would recommend you to test everything. Otherwise, you can break uh, rockets or worst. So here you have the, the library that we are using, the Spark testing base. Uh, it can share Spark context between test case, and also it provides some metrics to, to make it easier. You have uh, readers, you can have uh, JSON to data frames, converters, and extra validators. Also here, like I shared before, the Spark area. Here I'm sharing also the Spark fast test, also by Matthew Powers. It's quite faster than the Spark testing base. However, it doesn't support uh, streaming. So that depends on you. What are you doing to, you, to choose one or another one? For uh, testing, this is a code from the library. It's not our code. But one thing that I want to show is um, here. It's already highlighted. Reuse context if possible. By default, is false. Also here, I would recommend to read the documentation. Because in our case, we were using this uh, feature, and we, it was taking like a 30 minutes or one hour to take all the Spark test. And we were saying, why is happening that if we are using the shared context? And it was because we didn't read the documentation. And in the documentation, it said, turn that flag on, and it will share the context. So I would recommend you to, to do it before using libraries. So this is our code. It's uh, the NSR Spark suite. We have this flag to true, so we share the context between uh, test cases. One thing that you need to be aware of here is that if you're um, creating views or doing something with the, the context, you are sharing that between tests. So if you're using the same view name, maybe you are going to have some problems between them. Also, we provide some uh, different uh, methods so people can use it. Now, as I said before, JSON fixture to data frame, so you have a fixture in a Scala that you want to use. Instead of just coding everything and transforming to data frame, just provide the fixture and the schema, and we provide the data frame in the way. Also, the check schemas, you know, sometimes the, the schema can be uh, not sorted between data frames, so we sort it and, and all for, for people. Here is just uh, please test everything if you test separately, then when you put all together, it will be easier because you know that each individual part, it works. Maybe when, depending on who you merge it, maybe you will break something, but at least each individual part will work. And then the last point of my talk is how we reduce the test time execution by, skip, by skipping an affected test that at the end, as I said before, is less coffees. So uh, how many of you are experiencing Troubles with running the test, like taking a lot of time. Okay, well, the other ones are the ones that are not testing, <laughs> right? <laughs> I see you. 
So I would like to share a work of one of my uh, ex-teammates at Chipstead. It's a really good one. It's uh, from Raquel Pau. Uh, she was providing a JUnit extension that it tracks all the code that is affected or is uh, invoked by, by each, each test. How it works? Well, first of all, how it, you can configure. We were using Gradle there, not SVT, so, but at the end, more or less, it's quite similar. You need to, to define the, the dependencies and the agents that will, will run with the GVM. Also, we were using Travis, so you need to, this plugin is using uh, the Git nodes to keep track of all the code affected, so you can check it between the master and all the pull requests, what are the difference and what it needs to execute. And then we were providing two traits. One is the normal one, the, the one that we are already used, that it will run always, that is the unit spec. And then we have the inter integration test, that is the test that we only want to run if something changes, because it are the ones that are taking too long. How it works is that it has the runner, the listener, and the agent, and when a test starts, it sees <clears throat> all the code that is invoked for that, and it stores in the Git nodes. So later, when you run again this test, it checks if this part of the code was affected or not. In case of it was affected, it will run it again, otherwise not. So more or less, this is the Git nodes show. Here you have all the example that for this class, the context suite, it has the method, and then it knows all the classes that were loaded by this uh, test. And then when you run it again, it says skip, because I didn't change it, the code. So I will skip maybe two minutes for that test, one minute, I don't know, that depends on what are you doing there. But if uh, the unit tests are supposed to be faster and the integration tests are the ones that are taking all the, the time, then if you just are changing, I don't know, one transform or something that is not related with a Spark, but it's in the, in the project, you don't want to run everything. So that should allow you to uh, skip all the, the work. Here, there are two links, two articles that I really recommend to you. The first one was the inspiration for her, real impact testing analysis for GBM. And the second one is a, a slide from her that are really good, the, the rise of test impact analysis, how it can impact all the analyzing all the tests that we are doing for having uh, better practices. Uh, here I have some summary, like uh, please use transform as pills, as I used see before. Uh, you can have like individual transformers, no? it's uh, more atomic things, but then you can empower your people by uh, compiling them together. Don't duplicate code, you know the Abel twins, so don't call them. Modularize your code, as I'm saying, no? you have the readers, the transformers, the context, the writers, everything and then you put all together, and don't be afraid of testing everything. I know that it can be like, a, it takes time, but you don't want to break rockets, you don't want to break your things in production. So you have the tools, you have the right tools to do it, so don't be lazy and uh, do it. And at the end, one thing that uh, I will encourage you is to share all you built as a library, even if it's inside your company, it doesn't need to be open source, but if it's inside your company, share it everything that you build. Maybe you have one team that is using the same data set that you, so why not you collaborate together building some transformers for the same data or some readers or writers for everything. So uh, don't be afraid, and I think that uh, sometimes it's better to invest some time building uh, team libraries or compa company libraries for the data, so then other people from other teams or areas on the company can be uh, empowered by that. So if you do, all of this, you can build castles, Lego castles, like that one, and then you have uh, better products and uh, better people. So, thank you. So, any questions? Uh, hi, uh, it's Grace Talk. So, so uh, I have two questions. The first question, so you know, Transformers, uh, could you comment on why you choose data frames instead of data sets, or what's like pro and cons? As an interface for transformers. The thing is that data frame is a data set of rows. So at the end is data set to data set. Uh, okay. Right? But, but primarily you use data frame as a, like all the interface for the transformers, right? I don't understand your question. Uh, okay. Yeah, probably we can talk offline. Uh, sure. Another question. So, so you have a lot of trans transformations. So how do you let people discover those transformations? And what if they are not flexible enough 
what if they want to extend it? I can hear you very well. Oh, so, so you have a lot of transformations. Mm -hmm. So how do you help people discover all those transformations? Yeah. And what if they are not flexible enough, then how do you actually maintain those? Sure. Let me come back to here. That one. So one thing that you can do is like you can define your transformations by saying what is the input column and the output column. That's for the, sec the second question that you asked. So it's like, OK, you are extracting something, but the, the thing that you're looking for, the columns that you need for this transform to work, are that ones. Also, if you check the uh, Spark Daria, uh, well, this, sorry, these uh, articles, there is a lot of information about this, how to handle that. The, there is some information like, OK, you can define transformations, but also you can define and specify some metadata to the transformations. And then you can check it when you change them. Then for the transformations catalog, that depends of you and your communication in the company. In our case, it was more like uh, showing and demos and talking to each other and having some people that were like a dev rel, like uh, knowing what was being done in its uh, team. But at the end, it's, I think it's uh, a matter of communication inside the company. Okay, yes, thank you. Thanks for the talk. Um, so the transformation pattern, I, I, I think, is a really great idea. Um, how do you handle transformations that are, because it's a function of data set to data set, what about if your function needs to close over some other variable, like a configuration value or another object that, like how do you handle the serialization issues that you could periodically run into? Oh, serialization, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's fine, right? <laughs> yeah, I understand you. Um, we put all the transformation in an object companion, so it doesn't depend on the class. Okay. And then uh, here is like uh, these first things, you know, the call name, output, and JSON schema. It could be like the configure variable that you, are spe that you need. You know, so when you define, when you call this, you are passing these uh, attributes that you are going to use it. So it shouldn't be any serialization problem. All uh, right, I see what you mean. OK, thanks. Welcome. Hi, great session. Uh, I had a couple of questions about the testing. So uh, we also use the Horton Caro framework for some of our testing use cases. So uh, that's good. Uh, I had one question. So how do you test uh, some of the transformations like which has which returns a unit basically, which uh, like a void? Can you speak higher? I Sorry, don't know why I cannot okay. hear it. Okay. Uh, so if you go back to the previous slide, you had some uh, methods which is like returning a, a unit. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you test uh, those kind of stuff, which is not like purposefully returning a data frame where you can do a data frame compare? The compare thing yeah. about data frames? Yeah, like if you go back, like if I'm not returning a data frame, but I'm returning a unit, how? The uh, here? Yeah, the last one, for example. OK. So if I have a method which is returning that, mm -hmm. uh, how, do you, how are you testing, doing a unit test case for methods like this? For checking, uh, sorry, uh, just to, to validate. For checking between data frames? Yes. Uh, one thing that we used to do is like we pass them to JSON mm -hmm. and then we check them. Also, one thing that we used to do is like uh, since the data frames are not supposed or to have the same order, not the rows, right. one thing that we specify is the, the rows that we are going to use to sort them, that you say, okay, these rows should be the ones that define the order, and then we check them together row by row, like a list of rows or like a JSON. OK, OK, I get that. And got it, OK. Um, the second question, do you guys use any like code coverage tools to see how much code coverage uh, it has, like, like Sonar or something like that? The Scala coverage? Code coverage, yeah. The, the default one that comes with the Scala. OK. Oh, thank you, everyone.